This is the lect pre-lab lecture for Lab 4, Reactions of Calcium. Last week in lab, you dealt with percent composition, where you started dealing with the chemical formulas of compounds and dealing with the mathematical conversions there. We're going to continue to expand upon that this week with um, this lab, which is the first in about four that deal exclusive, exclusively with reactions. So for this lab, you're going to be dealing with mass to moles stoichiometry, where you use molar mass to go between grams and moles. Hopefully you've seen that in class already and are f comfortable with it, but if not, I'm going to give you an example. Then we'll be dealing with the mole to mole ratio. Now, some of you have probably done that in class already, but balancing equations and becoming comfortable with those coefficients is important here. And so just in case you haven't covered it, uh, we're going to go ahead and talk about it here. Then we'll cover the purpose of this lab, the overall reason that we have each step in here. And then we'll go through exactly what you're going to do and why for each part. So let's just deal with the mass to mole stoichiometry. Now if you look, Let's pause this while I find it. OK, so what we're going to be doing is converting between grams and moles using the molar mass. And in your pre-lab, you have this nice little table set up to kind of explain how to do that. But say, for example, on the periodic table, we're going to be dealing with calcium. So we'll deal with calcium a little bit. Uh, calcium has the atomic mass of 40.0. Now, this mass is in units of grams per mole. It's on the periodic table to indicate that is its atomic mass. Every, mole, every time you have 40.0 grams, you have one mole. Or one mole is going to have exactly 40 grams of calcium. If you were to look at carbon, carbon has got 12.01 um, and, and so on. I think magnesium is something like 24.3. And you have your atomic masses there. Well, generally, in lab, you're going to be measuring out grams, not moles. So on the scale this week, you measure out some amount of calcium. Um, for math purposes, I'm going to uh, use a larger quantity, but the, the concept is still the same. So on your scale, you're going to add in a couple chunks of your calcium, and this calcium is going to have a mass. So maybe you have uh, 1.0 grams. That's more than you need, but it'll make my math easier. So you're going to record this as 1.0 grams or however many decimal places you have. You want to have the right number of sig figs. But generally, we like to talk about things in terms of moles. And so we're going to set it up so that this 40 grams per moles will cancel and leave us with units of moles. So to do that, I'm going to pick grams of calcium down here and one mole up here. So it's 40.0 grams every time I have, oh, well, one mole. It's there. So in your calculator, you have 1.0 times 1 divided by 40. And when you do that, you're going to get something like 0 0.025 moles of calcium. To have the complete correct answer, you need to not only have moles, but the, the chemical as well. And just as a check, grams cancels, leaves us with the units of moles calcium. Now, when you are dealing with moles, just remember that this is just some quantity. It, one mole has the exact same number of things every single time. When we say a dozen, it means 12. We say a mole, it's just a number. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind as you're going through this. Now, guys. We measured out one gram of calcium, and we ended up getting 0 0.025 um, moles of calcium. When you guys are doing this, you're going to be measuring out an even smaller amount. You're going to be measuring out 0 0.05 or 0 0.20 grams. Now, when you do that, you're going to have an exp another whole uh, factor of 10 smaller. 
So keep in mind that your moles is going to be a relatively small ratio here. Um, it's going to be a small number, and that's okay. So to go between grams and moles, you're just going to set up your molar mass to be down here, and your moles goes on top. If you wanted to do something else, say you wanted to find out how many grams is in 0 0.15 moles of carbon. You can do that too. We're still going to go between grams and moles, which means we're still going to need this molar mass. It's just that now we're going to be starting with 0.15 moles of carbon. And so one mole comes down here. Moles of carbon cancels. You're going to put the molar mass of 12.01 grams that I get from the periodic table here. And in the calculator, you're going to enter 12.01 times 0.15. And you get something like, uh, I can't fit it there, so I'm going to come down here and say 1.8 uh, grams of carbon. So that's how you do the mole, mass to mole stoichiometry. If you wanted to do mole to mole ratios, in this lab, this is the first lab where you're going to be using those mole to mole ratios. It is not going to be the last. Generally, we are going to talk about multiple ratios in terms of the coefficients for a balanced equation. So for example, in this lab, you're dealing with several things. HCl will react with NaOH to make uh, sodium chloride and water. Now if you notice, on this side of the equation, I have one, two hydrogens. I have one oxygen and one sodium and one chlorine. On this side, I have two hydrogens, one oxygen, one sodium, one chloride. That is good because it means this equation is balanced. It tells us that no atom, no molecule is created or destroyed. It's just being rearranged by the reaction. In addition to that, we can read this uh, equation uh, like a sentence that's explaining the reaction itself. And so for us, we can say the reactants on the left react to produce the products which are on the right. So hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide react to produce sodium chloride and water. Now, every time one HCl reacts, one NaOH reacts. So it's a one-to-one -one ratio here. Kind of like uh, if you had a hot dog and a bun. You're only going to need one hot dog and one bun to make, uh, I don't know, I guess a snack. Um, it's a one-to-one -one ratio every single time. Here, it's the same thing. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. Now, if we had something that's a little bit more challenging, something like calcium reacting with HCl, if we were to tell you that calcium is going to form a compound with chlorine, you guys should know, ion number, charge, total, that if you have calcium, and chlorine. Calcium is in group 2, so it should be a 2 plus charge. Chlorine is 1 minus because it's in group 7. So these should react in a 1 to 2 ratio to make CaCl2. Oh, and then hydrogen gas, which we don't expect you to know is being produced yet, um, but we're getting there. We're getting really close, which is why we're offering so much help at this point. Now, if we were to check here, we've got calcium, hydrogen, and chlorine in this reaction. I have one calcium, one hydrogen, one chlorine on the left, one calcium, two hydrogens, two chlorides on the right. This is not balanced. In order to balance this equation, you have to change the coefficient. You can't come in here and change the subscript because that changes the compound. It's not possible to do that. 
So instead, the way that we balance equations is by adding a coefficient 2 here. This 2 applies to the H, and it applies to the Cl, so that now we have two hydrogens, two chlorides, and overall this is completely balanced, which is good. Now for this reaction, the way that we would explain it is we would call this one mole of calcium reacts with two moles of hydrochloric acid to produce one mole of calcium chloride and one mole of hydrogen gas. Uh, well, you don't know it's a gas, but one mole of hydrogen, yay. Um, so this is going to tell us our mole to mole ratio. And so say, for example, um, you have the grams of calcium, you weigh out some number of grams, you can easily convert to moles using the molar mass of calcium, which is 40 grams per mole. Then if you wanted to talk about something like calcium chloride, or you could talk about HCl, or you could go convert to something else using the coefficients in that balanced equation. So every time you have one mole of calcium, you know, according to this reaction, one mole of calcium reacts to produce one mole of CaCl2. So you end up with one mole of your product. If you have 0. Oops, 0. 0.25 moles of calcium, you could look at your reaction and say, oh, well, every time I have one mole of calcium, I produce two moles or I use two moles of HCl. So I'm going to have 0 0.50 moles of HCl that I need to use. It's all about this ratio. It's all about the mole to mole or the coefficients. And so just kind of keep in mind as you're working through this lab that you're doing two different steps. You're converting between grams and moles, and you're going to be going between two different substances using that mole to mole ratio. So for this lab, you are again expanding on your ability to do dimensional analysis with grams, moles, and the beginning part of stoichiometry where you're talking about converting between two different substances using that mole to mole ratio. Then you are going to work on how calcium reacts and how the products are going to form and so on. Um, and then because this is the first lab where you have more than one dangerous chemical, um, it's really important that you are completely safe and you are completely prepared for this lab. So let's just talk about what you're going to be doing in Part A. In Part A, you take um, a small piece of calcium, it doesn't tell you a weight, you don't need much to be honest. Um, actually, let me, let me do it this way, I need more space. You are going to gather a beaker, I forget what size because my procedure isn't open, and you're going to fill it with water. When you do that, you have the potential to get a reaction. Remember last week in the percent composition lab, we told you guys that the, the metals, calcium and magnesium, react with water. And just to be very um, cautious when handling them. So you're going to do the same thing this week, OK? Here, you're going to have um, a beaker of water. And you're going to essentially do the exact same thing you did last week. You're going to have a big, uh, excuse me, a test tube instead of a graduated cylinder. You're going to fill this sucker all the way to the top with water so that it's all the way to the brim. Then you are going to, in a very scientific way, um, cap this with your thumb. That's a thumb. Kind of looks like a thumb, right? Um, invert it so that your test tube is now upside down and it's got all the water. Hopefully you don't see any bubbles here, okay? You want this to be completely full of water. 
At the same time that one of you is preparing this and getting wet, at this point there's no danger because there's no metal here. Um, this has to be set up before you go any further. Um, so at the same time that you're setting up this, your lab partner, or you depending on who's assigned, is weighing out, oops, I didn't know I could do that with my hand, that's good, um, is weighing out a small piece of calcium. It doesn't tell you how much, just some small amount. So then you're going to come over and once you have this set up correctly, you're going to dump that small piece of calcium in here. Uh, it takes a couple of seconds, but after you have the calcium in here, you're going to move the test tube so that the opening of that test tube, it's not, you don't need to move it down, you just need to hold it slightly above this piece of calcium. Because what's going to start happening is you're going to get some bubbles that start to form. And so as the bubbles form, you want to collect them in the test tube. And it's really, you're not quantifying it because you're not using the graduated cylinder here. It's more a matter of um, seeing that this is a gas producing reaction or it is definitely reacting. And it's just a way to build into the next lab, which is types of reactions. So just kind of um, collect your gas. And when that's done, you are going to test this paper or this water with litmus paper. Now litmus paper is really cool. Um, if you have pink litmus paper that turns blue, it means that there is a base, blue for base. If you have blue litmus paper that turns pink, it means you've got an acid. Kind of like uh, your faucet um, at home, acid is always hot, uh, it's always red. So red, uh, hot, same thing. Either way, it burns you. Now what you should see is the indication of a base. And if you're already into chapter three, or really, honestly, anywhere in chapter two, you should already know that base for this part of the semester only means hydroxide. The hydroxide ion is the component that we call base. In a couple chapters, we add a few more to it, but this is the primary. This is the one that is the big kahuna, okay? So if you see blue, it means that you've got hydroxide present. If you see pink, it means you've got acid present. And so when you're dealing with this, calcium plus H2O reacts to make something. If you've got blue, it means you're gonna have hydroxides. And if it has the other, it would be the H plus. But in general, you're gonna see something with hydroxide. And you should be able to figure out if you make your table of ion number char oops, charge in total, how does calcium and hydroxide react? This is in group two. This has got a one minus charge. And so you can make your com compounds over here. Um, I will tell you that your gas is H2. So just come up with your calcium hydroxide and you should be good here. Emma? Uh, thank you. Um, okay, so now we've got to, through part A, let's talk about the calibration of those pipettes. Now, anytime you're going to use a disposable piece of plastic. You really cannot trust the fact that it's supposed to have a certain volume or it's supposed to do something it should. You need to calibrate it. And so what you're going to do is you've got these cheapo pieces of plastic that actually, to be entirely honest, work as well as the expensive ones. Um, and you're going to uh, calibrate these. So you're going to have two. One's going to be labeled A, one's going to be labeled B, and you're going to work with those. The A stands for acid. Guys, make sure this doesn't touch anything except acid. Make sure this one doesn't touch anything but base. Nothing else, or it will mess up everybody's numbers. Now what you're going to do is you are going to 
take from your acid, you're going to suck some of this into your pipette, and you are going to calibrate it by using a graduated cylinder. Now, when you go to drip this into your cylinder, you need to be very careful of a few things. One, you want to make sure that the drops do not touch the side of the graduated cylinder. If you get a drop stuck here, it's not going to be measured in the volume with your meniscus, and so that can be problematic. So you want your drops to go straight down the middle as much as possible. You also want to make sure that this pipette is exactly vertical. If it's exactly vertical, every single time you deliver a drop, it's going to happen exactly the same way. The drop sizes are going to be exactly uniform. You're not going to have um, some random thing happening. You want to be very systematic here so that every drop is going to be the same. Now, you are going to deliver um, the number of drops it takes to get to the 1.0, or depending on your graduated cylinder, 1.00 mil mark. And you're just going to record the number of drops. You're going to do that three different times. Personally, I found that it's, um, well, it's up to you guys. Um, it, it's relatively easy to do those in unison. Um, it's also seems to be easier for students if the same student calibrates the pipette as delivers it in part C. So it's up to you whether you decide to do that, but generally whoever's handling pipette A, I would re recommend you are the only person that touches pipette A all day. And then the same thing when you do it for B. Uh, whoever touches pipette B, the only person that touches pipette B all day. It's just going to make your numbers a little bit more consistent. No, no I don't. Go away. There we go. Um, now once you have the drops, you're going to get your average drop per mil. Okay? If you have the drops per mil and on the bottle of HCL or from your instructor, um, get the molarity. Now, the molarity according to keep your procedure for this should be close to 5.0 now guys um, it's not really 5.00 we're just not that good with the scale so make sure when you are doing this you get the third or all three sig figs. So you want to have the molarity. Um, for our purposes, I'm going to call this 5.00, and maybe it takes you 22 drops to reach one milliliter. Now, this is moles per liter and drops per mil. Now, if you look at this, we want to know the moles per drop. Here, we know the molarity, which is 5.00 moles per liter. Now, we don't have liters. We have milliliters. So the first thing we need to do is cancel liters and say one liter will give us 1,000 milliliters. And we know, according to our experiment, I'm guessing here, Generally, for students, this number is somewhere between 15 to 25. Um, it depends on your pipette, so I'm just using 22. And then every time we have one milliliter, we have 22 drops. Now, if you look, guys, liters cancels, milliliters cancels. We're left with moles per drop. The number here-ish should be 5. 0 0.0 times 1 times 1 divided by 1 and divided by 22 gives you something like 0 0.227 moles per drop. So when you're doing this math, it should be on that order of magnitude, somewhere between 0.1 and 0.3 probably. Now having the moles per drop is important because when you go to part C, you're actually going to be looking at 
two different reactions. You're going to be looking at how calcium reacts with HCl and how sodium hydroxide reacts with HCl. And the ratio of those reactions is going to be different for each one. And so, for example, a minute ago I had it already written out, but we'll write it again. Calcium reacts with HCl on that 2 to 1 ratio, where we have CaCl2 and H2. This is our theoretical. We think this should happen. Okay? We also know NaOH and HCl react exactly to produce H NaCl and H2O. This is, again, our theoretical yield. Now, what you're going to be doing is you're going to have a test tube, and you're going to have um, a piece of calcium. And then you're going to add in, so here's your calcium, some amount of HCl. And then you're going to add in your indicator or your methyl orange. The indicator is going to tell you, you have excess acid. You added in too much acid, but that's okay, because then you're going to go back and add in sodium hydroxide, and that's going to allow you to determine how much of this acid reacted with calcium and how much was really excess, okay? So what you're going to do in Part C is you're going to first add your calcium to your, sodium, to your test tube, Keep. Then, oops, you're going to add the HCl until you've added two mils. This two mils is important. Um, you need to make sure you add exactly the number of drops there. So if it took 20, mil, 20 drops to get a mil, you'll add 40 drops. If it took you 15 drops to get a mil, you'll add 30. If you add two mils, everything is going to work out really well for you guys. So you add two mils, you wait until it all stops bubbling, you add your indicator, and it's going to tell you you've got some acid there, okay? Now, you're going to then, counting the person who's in charge of the B pipette, is going to come back and add sodium hydroxide, or base, um, to this. Now, you're going to do that until this turns kind of a yellowish color. Um, it's an indication that everything has reacted just so. Okay. Now, when you are doing your data, this is probably the most interesting um, or most difficult, depending on how you view it, part of the lab. So the mass of calcium comes from the scale comes from the balance. Um, it's up to your instructor whether you use the analytical balance, which is preferred, or the little scales that you can take to your station. Um, you need to have at least two sig figs, though. Then you can easily convert to moles. We did that a few minutes ago using molar mass. You can do this before you add anything else in. Now, here, you're supposed to add two milliliters of HCl. And according to what we did a few minutes ago, you're going to have the moles per mil. Oops, where'd it go? Moles per drop. Yeah. So you're going to have the moles per liter, which you can convert to moles per mil, or you have the moles per drop multiplied by the number of drops you add. That's probably the better way. So you're going to add the moles per drop multiplied by the drops added, and that's going to give you um, your moles here. Now, ideally, you're supposed to add two mils, but that way, if you add an extra drop or something, you'll still have the right number. So make sure when you're showing your calculation for full credit, you're using the moles per drop from the previous couple pages 
multiplied by the exact number of drops you added. Um, now, here's where it gets difficult. For a lot of people, you want to continue on reading from left to right, and that's just not possible here. So instead, what we end up doing is coming and starting at this side of the table. You're going to know how many drops of NaOH it took to reach that yellow color. And because you know the moles per drop for NaOH, you can multiply to get the moles of NaOH added. Now, this is the hardest part of this lab, and it's like this for a reason, I promise. The moles of NaOH that are there react with the HCl that's left over after the calcium reaction. So these two numbers, this column and this column, should be the same. Same as here. Now then, where did it, let's use, let's use purple. You have the total HCl and you have the excess. So if you take the total and you subtract the excess HCl, you get the HCl that's used to react with calcium. And so this column minus this column gives you this column right here, okay? Now the great thing here, guys, is that if the reaction works, your experiment works, then the moles of calcium you had and the moles of HCl used in the calcium reaction should be in that same ratio. So if you go back to, oops, there it was, this, there's a one to two ratio here. Hopefully, you will see a one to two ratio here as well. We don't know if that's actually going to happen. Usually it gets, it's more like one to 1.9 or one to 2.1 just because of errors in the experiment. But for the most part, it works out pretty well. Make sure before you leave, you have all of the class data entered. It is a little bit longer because it's meant to show you how to practice with stoichiometry. But guys, check with your lab instructor. Most lab instructors are okay with only seeing one calculation. So if you show the calculation for this trial, you can just do the work here and not worry about showing it. Um, but check with your lab instructor. Hopefully this helps. And... I'll see you in lab. Keep.